On this episode, we look at wellness walkways in Vancouver, British Columbia. Then, we meet a walking advocate in Vancouver. Finally, we talk with an author about walking and romance. Stay tuned. We're talking with Alan Duncan, who's a planner for the city of Vancouver. A dozen years ago, we talked to you about wellness walkways. Back then, it was just a plan. What's happened since then? Uh, since then, we've begun to implement various aspects of it. And it's kind of interesting, it's 12 years later, because it takes a long time for incremental change to happen in a neighborhood. And, um, for example, we just looked at the crosswalk up at 12th and Sophia. That just went in two years ago. So there you go, 10 years uh, from the intention of doing something to something actually happening, funding catching up with the, uh, the improvements. And 12 years ago, what was the concept of wellness walkways, and has it evolved over the time in between? The concept of wellness walkways was to retrofit an existing neighborhood to make it as accessible to as many people and as many ways as possible through very subtle interventions in the in the streetscape. So the concept hasn't changed. Uh, I think some of the, impl the implementation story has changed over time. We um, tried some new ideas that we hadn't considered at the time because new ideas had come along. For example, the infiltration bulge wasn't something we thought about. That was more an ecological um, intervention and which had all of the same benefits that it's richly landscaped, beautiful flowers, so it has the same benefit as these landscape bulges but also acts as a biofiltration um, pond during a storm event. So yes, yeah, so there were new ideas that came along. A lot of the ideas are ideas that uh, just took time to implement over time. What, are, what would you say are the, the key components that, that go into this? Uh, you know, a lot of little things put together, but what are the most important things you're trying to do? The most important ones were small changes to important things. The sidewalks, for example. Our old sidewalks were 1.5 meters wide, which meant if you were out with other people in wheelchairs or walkers, for example, you had to go single file. We widened them to 1.8 meters, which is fairly small additional width, but it made a big difference that two walkers, two wheelchairs could go alongside and carry on a conversation. We used saw cut joints for, rather than trowel joints for the sidewalks, which gave a much smoother ride. Um, the advantage is if you are in a wheelchair, you can often have a great discomfort from the bumps that you get. And if you're going along at a great rate on the traveled sidewalks, you get that boom, 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 which can be actually quite painful. For people in walkers or uh, wheelchairs as well, we, uh, when we took people out for a walk around the neighborhood with walkers and wheelchairs, I remember one gentleman was carrying his walker and I said, oh, that's not how you're supposed to use it. He said, I know how I'm supposed to use it, but when I'm using it the way you're supposed to, I, it makes so much noise I can't hear the conversation. So it was really interesting that a smoother surface would make a big difference in your ability to have a conversation. So things like that. The sidewalk was an important one. Um, the other big change was putting benches throughout the neighborhood. And I think someone today said at the, the conference we were at that um, we only have benches in our commercial areas, we don't have benches in residential areas. But here we put a bench every mid-block and at every corner so that you always could have a place to sit and rest and you could always see where the next place was. So if you were frail, if you were um, infirm, you could go for a walk and you could judge based on your knowledge, your own limitations, of how far you could go and, uh, and to enjoy that. Uh, the benches were a bit of an experiment too. We put a pad next to some of them so a wheelchair could sit next to the bench or if you had a walker you could put it off to the side so it's not blocking the sidewalk. Or if you had a stroll or a bundle buggy, all those things, it's a place for that to be. The landscaping for the benches too, we tried to integrate the benches into the landscaping of the adjacent building so it felt like it was part of the garden, not something that was just plopped in without any thought. 
We also put some of the benches on half on city land, half on private land to try and blur that distinction. So people who lived in the buildings or were in the group home, whatever, felt comfortable using them. But people who walked along the street also felt like uh, they could use them comfortably. You mentioned landscaping. What, what, what sort of plants did you try to put along the, the sidewalks? What purpose do they, they have? Uh, that was interesting too when we took people around on the trial with walkers and uh, wheelchairs they commented that they'd like the fact in a few places you could actually touch the plants or smell the plants and they appreciated if you were visually impaired that that would be really important. Buildings have foundation planting back at the building face not out at the street where you can touch it and experience it and, and I remember one woman said well if you put flowers out there people would steal them and my response was, well, if everyone had them, then it wouldn't be stealing, it would be sharing. And they were quite happy with that concept that it would be sharing flowers, not stealing them. And it, that's worked very well. Most of the plants were chosen for color throughout the year, for texture. So if you touch them, they have different textures and, and different colors of foliage or, or flowers. And, and uh, scent, scent was a big one. Some of the trees that we chose were deliberately chosen for their fragrance and there are a couple of fragrant ashes planted in the neighborhood and when they're in bloom they just, the fragrance flows through the neighborhood, it's quite wonderful. We chose a lot of, we, done, we did different combinations of street trees which were all very unusual. On Sophia Street um, we planted a whole series of different small flowering trees, everyone's different but it blooms at a slightly different time so that people, regardless of the time of the year, will always be able to experience either a different fragrance or a different color or a different sensation. We wanted to have a lot of sensory appeal for people who can't go very far. That was kind of the intention around the landscaping. And you have all these plantings, you know, kind of close to the sidewalk. Uh, how, how are they taken care of? I mean, they can very easily grow out over the sidewalk and, and become a, a nuisance and not just uh, an, an attraction. Uh, who takes care of all this? Um, that varies. For example, Cavell Gardens, the seniors' residence, they did a very rich planting on both sides of the, the sidewalk and a uh, very interesting combination of street trees that they put in there. So they look after that. But most of the landscaping you see on the streets and boulevards and and the traffic circles are all done by people who live in the neighborhood. We have a program called Green Streets where people can actually adopt, formally adopt uh, the landscaping and we have a couple of cases of that in the neighborhood but a lot of it's just kind of done by neighbors who who like it. You'll see there are a lot of buildings here that don't have balconies so people don't necessarily have access to their own gardens so they quite appreciate the ability to come out and garden on the road. What sort of feedback have you gotten from, you know, seniors or people with disabilities? Uh, you know, has it been accomplishing what, what you hoped it would? It has. We did a, what we called a post-occupancy survey in 2003, at the end of 2003, um, which was kind of relatively early on in the process, but we wanted to gauge response. And if there were any things that could be tweaked, we wanted to know early on what what we could change to make it better and the overall satisfaction based on the survey was 96 percent that was an incredibly high satisfaction rate we asked them about their perceptions of safety we asked them about their access to shopping we asked them if there were people in their neighborhood who would benefit directly from the different um, types of amenities that were put in like benches and how many people would benefit from the benches and a high proportion of people said they used them and that they, it affected how they used the neighborhood. So the response was overwhelmingly positive and we got a number of comments like a lot of people with disabilities are coming to the neighborhood now. Well those people weren't coming to the neighborhood, they were always there, they were just never able to spend much time outdoors because there was no place to, to sit for example or a place to be. When you walk around here in the summertime you see a lot of people sitting on the benches talking to neighbors. Um, we just said the only bench that was taken out in the 12 years was replaced with a large seating area which again 
in the spirit of experimentation, this neighborhood was chosen as a place to pilot the, I think they call it the parking, the parking space park, I think is what the, the title for that one is, in conjunction with a nonprofit group here called Viva. So the area continues to evolve. We continue to try things over time. Uh, we had the benefit of provincial funding uh, about 10 years ago when we were just beginning to implement it. We haven't had that since, but uh, things have continued to evolve. The Wellness Walkways has expanded to the north into some of the new development on the other side of Kingsway uh, in a much more elaborated form, actually, much more um, elegant seating areas. There's some heritage interpretation that's gone in. Drinking fountains have gone in on the, the expansion. Some of the things that we've piloted here have become city standards as well, and uh, I was hoping to use the survey as a chance to actually approach engineering to suggest that we do that. And for the curb bulges and the curb ramps, they actually noticed them themselves and proceeded to, to make it a city standard without even consulting us. So that was, uh, it was a good thing. It was perceived as being a, a benefit by them on their own. So a lot of things have happened. Uh, the infiltration corner bulge I mentioned earlier has been adopted as a city standard now. You'll see them everywhere around Vancouver. Um, we're getting more benches in our residential neighborhoods and a lot of that was based on our experience here where the response to the benches was so positive. We're talking with Vernie Brown, who's with the Vancouver Ventures Volksport Club. What is a Volksport Club? Volksport Club is part of a, an international organization which offers recreational walking, non-competitive for people of all ages. So as a walker, you get to see a lot of the city. Uh, what sort of things annoy you as a pedestrian? Oh, I have several um, pet peeves about being a pedestrian. Roundabouts are one issue where motorists aren't always good about signaling where they're going to be coming off of the roundabout so pedestrians don't always know when it's safe to travel or to cross the road. We have um, situations here in Vancouver with intersections, major intersections with pedestrian crossing lights, but a pedestrian has to actually hit a button before they get the right to cross the road and that frustrates me. I would like the pedestrian walk signal to come on automatically. Um, other things, oh, um, crosswalks that aren't indicated on both sides or all sides of an intersection where pedestrians have to sort of go out of their way to cross officially in a crosswalk when they actually want to go straight ahead. So things like that, um, yes. Well, let's, let's look at those one at a time. Uh, you know, when you have roundabouts, uh, a lot of the discussion is about cars entering the roundabout, but uh, but you say it's, it's actually more of a challenge figuring out what the cars leaving the roundabout are going to do. That's correct, and signal, you can't depend on the signals from a motorist because they don't always know how they're supposed to signal when they are in a roundabout, how to let people know where they're turning out. And in some cases, cities that have put in roundabouts have put in crosswalks, but they're not that close to the roundabout. So the pedestrian has to go out of their way to cross where the city has decided would be safe for them to cross, rather than allowing them to cross closer to the actual intersection. And uh, sending pedestrians out of the way, you know, it happens in other circumstances. You mentioned, uh, you know, so a regular, you know, cross intersection where they only mark some of the crosswalks and expect you to cross multiple legs to rather than just cross the one leg. Um, what, what sort of thinking goes goes into that? I mean, that that people, you know, would would have pedestrians cross three legs instead of one. I'm not sure, but I think the bottom line for most people, they want to go straight ahead. They don't want to have to do a little detour just because somebody has indicated that they should be crossing a road that they didn't want to cross to get across the next major road and then back again. 
Um, that's in the design. I don't know all the reasons, but most pedestrians, if they just wanted to go straight ahead, they would cross straight ahead. That's human nature, A to B, go directly. And so it's frustrating when you're actually, quotation mark, disobeying the law because you're not going to where the crosswalk is actually indicated, painted on the roadway. Although in the Motor Vehicle Act, there is an invisible or hidden, no, that's not the word. Um, there is a crosswalk there, it's just not painted. And so legally pedestrians can cross even though there aren't painted lines on the road. But when you see that there are painted lines, you might feel you're obligated to go out of your way to cross correctly. And then uh, your third frustration was with the push buttons. You're at a busy <laughs> right. intersection, the light's changing every cycle anyway, but they make you push the button. Um, what happens if you aren't there to push it at the right moment? You get frustrated like I do and you wait for the next cycle. It's If it's an intersection you're familiar with, you know that you have to push the button, you know where the buttons are. If it's an unfamiliar intersection, you might not be aware of either where the button is or that you have to push the button. And so you end up having to wait the cycle. And you also have the situation where you sort of run the last few steps to get to the button and hopefully you've pushed it in time. Whereas if it was automatic that the pedestrian walk signal came on, you knew you had time to walk to that corner and safely cross the road while you had the hand telling you, no, not the hand, the person walking telling you it was safe to cross. Um, to me, having the pedestrian light come on automatically would not hinder any motorists because they know at intersections they're supposed to watch out for pedestrians. If they got there and there was no pedestrian in the crosswalk, they could do whatever they wanted to do going through that intersection. If there's a pedestrian there, they would stop or hopefully stop. So I would like a little bit more recognition of these minor frustrations that pedestrians face that municipalities are willing to make life a little bit easier for pedestrians and not add to frustrations of myself and others. We're talking with Van Wallach, author of A Kosher Dating Odyssey. What's your book all about? Hi, John. The, the book is really on several themes. Uh, overall, uh, Kosher Dating Odyssey is about my dating life, uh, online dating primarily uh, through JDate, Match, and, and uh, other sites uh, after I uh, started getting divorced in 2002. It really deals with the uh, kind of the highs and lows of online dating. At the same time, the book is about my own uh, spiritual odyssey, if you will, from growing up in Texas in a Christian household to becoming aware of my Jewish background and embracing that and celebrating that and how Judaism became uh, deeply connected to my experiences both uh, in education at Princeton, uh, dating in the 80s, and then dating in the 2000s. What on earth would walking have to do with dating? Walking actually has a surprising um, connection to dating. It really works on two different levels. On the first level, you have walking as a cliché. Uh, if you look in uh, dating profiles on JDate, etc., You'll see a lot of them routinely talk about walks along the beach, sunset walks, uh, walking in the park, uh, to the point where it becomes rather comical that people talk about that. But that's at the, the level of kind of cliche. On the level of reality, people really do take walks. And I have had walks on the beach in uh, Mystic, Connecticut. I've had walks around lakes at uh, Rockefeller Park in uh, Westchester County, New York. I've had walks. Uh, really all over and in fact walking is integral to getting to know somebody. It provides a context where you're not in a static bar or restaurant, you're actually in a dynamic setting where you can talk, you can observe, you're in a changing environment, 
you can see how people respond to different settings and you can, they can see how you respond. So it's actually a, a great element from the begin, very beginning of a romance or attempted romance. <laughs> and you talk about, you know, there's the, the usual, you know, walk on a beach or whatever. Uh, what about if you're in the city? Well, uh, walking in the city is also great because there are, uh, for a lot of people, you know, I live in Connecticut, so I would often meet people in New York City. And so there were loads of ways to uh, do walks. Uh, in fact, the very first date that I had that I talk about in the book in 2002 involved meeting a woman on Fifth Avenue. I'd actually met her through an ad in the foreword, the last uh, print ad I ever responded to. We met on Fifth Avenue. We went looking for a place to get a glass of wine. And we were walking on Fifth Avenue. And it was very memorable, uh, both because it was my very first date and also because it was about 15 degrees at the time. And it was a walk that I was very eager to end the walk and get someplace warm. So it doesn't have to be 75 and, and sunny to, to go on a walk? No, you can uh, do a walk anytime you want, uh, just as long as you have the, uh, the right companion and also the right clothing for the occasion. So what are, what are some of the more interesting places you've, you've gone for a walk you know, around New York City? Well, the one that really stands out is uh, the High Line, which is a great new uh, development. Uh, it's uh, abandoned railroad tracks that have been turned into an urban walking path on the, uh, the west, far west side. And I have been to that several times with my significant other, a woman I met online that we've been dating for several years now. And it's just a great urban environment where you're walking, you see the city all around you from a completely different perspective being elevated. Uh, you can see buildings, you can see the uh, Hudson River, and you see all the other New Yorkers around you. Uh, it's beautifully designed, it's got great views, and it's something that's constantly growing. It started as a one-section uh, recovered pathway. It's now grown to a, there's a second section, I believe just recently, the final section of it was added, so it's now going to be a several mile walkway. And I'm excited about the opportunity to go there and do some more walking. Now, when you go walk down a place like the High Line, do you see other couples? Yes, the High Line is definitely a, a good date place. Uh, couples like to go there because it's uh, next to Greenwich Village, exciting neighborhoods in New York. So you can go for a walk and then you can go to go out to dinner and then what you do after that is, you know, your business. But uh, the High Line is definitely a great place for a date. And you get out in the countryside, there's the, the leisurely stroll along the beach. Uh, how about for people who are a little more athletic? Well, for people who are more athletic, you have a couple of other options. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, there's Appalachian Trail, which goes through Westchester. You also have other walking trails and even biking trails that have been uh, recovered maybe from old rail lines or other paths. So you can take it as fast or as slow as you want. Uh, they are, you can jog if you want to. So uh, the significant other and I uh, actually go for uh, a little more strenuous walk. She's, even though she's shorter than I am, she's quite a fast walker. And I have to uh, challenge myself to keep up with her. And, uh, you know, there's no, uh, no slouching around when we're out together in uh, Westchester. Um, there are also, I've also had other very memorable walks in the suburbs. Uh, Westport, Connecticut has beaches, and those are great places for walking. Uh, Rockefeller State Park in Westchester County has uh, walking paths, lakes, ponds. It's a great place to go. In fact, in the book, I mention uh, a walk I had with a woman I, I tried to date, and I even have a picture that she took of me on a by a lake on, when we were on a walk, and I said, why don't we go for a walk around the lake? And in fact, that's what we were doing at the time. So I can actually associate walking with a lot of different memorable first dates, second dates, and just get-togethers. It's one thing if you're in New York and you have the High Line or you live near the beach. Uh, how about if you don't have something like that nearby? Well, what you're going to have nearby is something that's unique to your area. Every place has its own natural settings, you know, park systems, maybe not in your town, but something nearby. It might be a river, it might be a national park, it might be a monument. 
So I would say search the mail, check with tourist authorities, visitor centers, find out what's in your area that might be a good walk. Get out and support walking and support outdoor activities. Uh, and if you meet somebody uh, that you want to have a date with and walking, it's a great way to get to know somebody because it gives you it's kind of a quiet time to talk and get to know each other, see how the other person reacts to being outside. Are they an outdoor person or are they an indoor person? Are they a fast walker or a slow walker? How to, it's just a way to see somebody in a, a more natural and less artificial setting. And you could ha wind up having a great time and finding uh, perhaps a love connection or at least a walking connection. Welcome to all of you from uh, all over the world, the 25 plus countries I understand, and there's some uh, potent locals here as well who've been real advocates for change, and particularly for uh, making sure that people can walk around our city, our region, our province. It is uh, a top transportation priority in the city of Vancouver, and that's something that goes back, uh, certainly predates me as mayor and, and many of the staff working uh, at the city. Now, this has been a top transportation priority for many years of the city of Vancouver. So there's a legacy here in our city of prioritizing walking. And that doesn't mean we, uh, we have it all figured out by any stretch. We still have uh, lots of challenges, uh, lots of safety and convenience uh, issues. We're still focused at, at the, the, the young and uh, aging end of the spec ends of the spectrum and trying to encourage kids to walk or ride their bikes to school. And, uh, and have walking school buses. There's a constant uh, challenge to encourage more and more of that. And, and as well, um, on the seniors end of the spectrum, making sure that there's good walking paths around our city and that uh, we continue to build our Greenways network. So we have right now 65 kilometers of Greenways that connect our parks, our community centers, schools, uh, neighborhoods. A uh, key piece of, of uh, stitching the city together with good walking paths. We're very blessed to have uh, an incredible seawall that stretches about 26 kilometers uh, along the waterfront around Stanley Park and False Creek, and, uh, and then some little pockets of it that carry on out to the west to UBC and then up the Fraser River. So we've still got uh, we've still got some chunks of that in the years ahead. That took about 70 years of commitment. So uh, generations of government, generations of community involvement and advocacy to make sure that our waterfront is accessible by foot. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.